Yes, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to this final breakfast webinar before the summer. My name is Eric and I'm a research engineer here at ITRL. Slides are important. Okay, yes, so first some uh, instructions. Uh, we ask you to keep your microphone muted and your camera turned off uh, until you wish to speak. And uh, if you have any questions at all uh, during the presentation or during the, the Q&A afterwards, please use the raise hand feature or uh, the chat and we will direct your question to Romain. Okay, <laughs> so uh, today we will get to listen to Romain Rampler, who's a researcher here at uh, KTH and at the Center for Eco2 Vehicle Design where he focuses on acoustics and noise. He has also previously participated in uh, other projects with ITRL. And uh, we thought it would be very interesting to highlight the topic of noise, uh, since as Romain will discuss, uh, it uh, really affects us all and is a major side effect from transportation. Yes, like I said, there will be a Q&A session uh, afterwards, but if you have any questions, uh, let us know or type in the chat. But uh, yeah, with that, I would like to welcome Romain. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for the introduction. So I will uh, share the screen, which I guess now you get to see my slides with a title page. Yes, so uh, thank you all for connecting. Uh, it's quite a few faces that uh, I know already. It's uh, nice to see you here. So. Uh, as mentioned by Eric today, the thought was to present, actually to build upon what uh, some activities that have been done with ITRL in the, in the past few years uh, in connection with the noise and the uh, assessment of its impact in essentially um, yeah, most focused in on urban environments. So um, we will see a few application cases which have to do with the city of Stockholm in particular, but also the city of Munich, for instance, in some of the projects. And the idea is, uh, I thought for today, is just to give an overview of some of the activities. Has, it has built up over the years and has changed slightly for us on the, on the tools and the weight that we have had at our hands to, to uh, address those issues. Uh, so, and we, I, I was thinking of taking in two bits and, and they actually merged to a common objective in this, to try to actually shift from the sources, the noise that you get at the sources and what, uh, how, close can you approach it to the actual receiver of the noise, which is what we are interested in in the end. But before I get started, so my name is uh, Roman Rampler, uh, as Eric nicely introduced me, and I'm part of this uh, lab for sound and vibration research, MWL at KTH, so that's part of engineering and mechanics. And then I'm also part of the Center for Eco2 Vehicle Design, which is a Vinova uh, financed uh, center, uh, which has uh, large set of collaborations in the industry, uh, including uh, overlapping industries with uh, ITRL, such as Kenya is also part of it. And then we have Volvo, major, major industries of the, uh, of the transport industry. But what I would like to highlight as well is that uh, uh, actually most of the, what is included in this presentation has been building upon, uh, upon early projects in ITRL. And then there are students who have started to work with me the past two, Two years, Siddharth Ben Kataraman and Sasha Bakle, who have contributed to a lot of the content of this presentation. So I would like to highlight also those, those students who are still working with us. And I think that would be uh, happy to uh, connect to some ongoing activities like the ITRL as well. So, about what I will present today. Well, the, the background there is the, the problem of noise in urban environments. And uh, you, I think, noise is some something that everyone can relate to when you live in cities. Uh, and I think the easiest way we relate to it is in terms of annoyance, as you can see here. Uh, because we are directly impacted, we can be, can be in connection with, uh, for instance, sleep disturbance and things like this. And that is a very easy way to relate to noise and the impact of noise in urban environments. But noise goes beyond that because associated, and essentially associated in part to sleep disturbance, you have a lot of uh, cascade effects. Uh, and and uh, noise becomes more than just a, an issue of annoyance, it becomes a health issue. You have all this set of 
of recognize issues that are uh, derived from the exposure to, uh, to high levels of noise. And high level of noises can be not so high in the end in terms of your perception, but it's the long-term exposure to disturbances that can actually trigger some health effects. And the, the uh, issue with that is that it's, it's not expected to, uh, to end tomorrow, even though we are shifting to an electrified transport system, you are not getting rid of the uh, tire road interaction problem where you have uh, like actually at higher speeds uh, still the same amount of noise produced. And the issue is that uh, we, we are living in a world that, that is, uh, is getting more and more urbanized. Uh, you have here a UN projection for the urban population growing from 55% to 68% by 2050. So uh, addressing the problem of noise in urban environments is definitely something that we should take into account when we are looking at the transport system. Now, when it comes to noise, this is a very brief uh, uh, introduction. I, I have to say that I will not go into very technical details today. The, the idea is to give you an overview of uh, what can be done and what we're looking, uh, looking at. But still, you, this, this key uh, scale that you have all heard about, I guess the decibel scale, which is the, uh, the scale, the unit that is being used to, uh, uh, to measure noise levels. And you may have heard a lot about it, and sometimes it may be for some of you a bit uh, confusing. Well, you, most of you may have quite some, uh, some uh, background that allows you mathematically to know that this is a logarithmic unit, the decibel. And essentially, it allows to scale ratios. And that's, that's important in acoustics because you actually, the ear, which is what we are interested in, our perception is actually able to catch a very broad range of pressure variations from very low pressures, 10 to the power minus six, so micropascals to, to actually thousands of pascals. So if you would have to keep that unit in terms of pascals for the pressure, uh, you would have to deal with a, a, a very like over billions, it could be a range of billions of, uh, of, uh, of pascals of difference between the lowest orders and the highest orders. And that's why it's good to use the decibel scale because it allows to scale ratios so that we have a, a good representation in the limited scale about the actual noise that is being produced. And actually, it turns out that our, the human perception is actually working logarithmically. So it's a well-suited unit also to describe what we are in to a degree perceiving. Uh, here, I just added a few ratios of interest. If we are talking about we are talking about the sound power. So essentially the way we would describe sources, the noise that comes from sources, uh, one decibel would correspond about to the, what we usually call the just noticeable difference. So you, you can perceive if we play, if we play two sounds, I could have done that today, but if we play two sounds with one dB difference, you may be able to pick up the difference between the, the two levels. And then if we move to a slightly higher level, three dB difference, uh, in terms of power, that means uh, doubling or halving the power. But actually, if you have to go in terms of perception, you have to go to about 10 dB difference. And that corresponds to a factor 10. And then 20 dB decibels difference would be a factor 100 in the sound powers in terms of Pascal's. So a few examples, you have the full scale here for, this is sound pressure level. So what essentially we would be measuring with microphones and what you would be perceiving. Uh, for different examples that you have here, we could highlight, for instance, this range, 40 to 60 dB uh, decibels corresponding to a normal conversation, fairly quiet home environments, although questionable of about 60 dB decibels, it starts to be quite uh, substantial. And then 80 decibels could correspond to a, a heavy traffic taken at about 10 meters from the actual traffic uh, segment. Now here you have a few general guidelines in terms of limitations. Usually we say that uh, 30 decibels should be the equivalent average level. Average meaning you, that you average over a period of time, uh, shorter, longer periods of time. That should be the level indoors in your accommodations. You notice here a little A, I will not enter into the detail, but essentially this is, this is modifying this decibel Scale, the total 
aggregated number that you get for a level, yeah, there is actually hidden under this uh, frequency content that is not equally distributed in frequency because the, the ear has a higher sensitivity to certain frequencies than others. So this A is a weighting factor that actually distributes differently the frequencies when you aggregate the noise levels to a single value. So no need to detail that, but essentially this A weighting has been pictured as corresponding quite nicely to the, to the human ear. Then if we go a bit higher level, this 45 dB should be the maximum level that you, you should be exposed to uh, indoor at night usually what is recommended. And then uh, 55 decibels, a weighted, should be the equivalent level average at the level at the facade. This is just to give you a few orders of magnitudes or, or orders of values that are relevant when it comes to discussing the decibel scale and the noise levels we could be measuring. But I will not focus too much on the levels today because as you will see, uh, I'm more, uh, I will, be more discussing noise in a relative sense, not really in the absolute levels that are triggered by, by regulation. Because if you talk about how a noise or how you perceive noise, it's actually quite important to talk about or to talk about this relative sense. So how, how, how many dBs have, have been increased by the add, adding a source, for instance, compared to a baseline level? This is a lot. Uh, it's a lot around this that I will be talking about noise today. And to illustrate the problem of noise in the urban environment, I think I will, uh, today I'm going back to a problem that has been addressed within ITRL, a project we, uh, to which we have been connected to for quite a few years in different types of projects. It's a problem, a project of, or the problem of, or the potential of shifting deliveries to, of peak hours essentially evening, night, when the traffic is a bit uh, uh, better. And the advantage there, if you, if you, the idea is of course to make the best use of the infra infrastructure to be able to uh, spread out the traffic over, over all the possible amount of time that we have. Uh, it, and it has been shown, and there's a few of you at ITRL that are working on this to, uh, to have the potential to increase efficiency, to increase profitability, uh, also to a degree to reduce pollutant emissions if you limit traffic, for instance, traffic jams and things like this, and where. The issue there is, of course, if you start to distribute the traffic to nighttime, for instance, you're, you're also distributing the traffic to very sensitive segments of the day when the uh, annoyance and exposure to noise becomes a bit more critical. So this is, this is uh, the context a little bit of what I will be talking about today. Uh, just to uh, mention some, some aspects that you may know about Stockholm since 2012, there's a ban for really heavy trucks to be running in the city between the 10 o'clock in the evening to six in the morning. And the way Stockholm city is addressing the issue of noise is that they respond they respond personally to complaint, complaints that may be addressed by citizens. So you can, you can understand that, uh, that opening this night segment is, is, a, is a key issue when it comes to noise because a city is not willing to uh, just having an overflow of complaints and suddenly having to respond to all of this. So the questions that, that we could raise is what are the conditions for off-peak deliveries to, in Stockholm, for instance, to to be functioning, how can we assess that? And what tools do we have? What methodologies do we have to be able to address that? And for this, we will distinguish two aspects. In terms of noise issues, you have the part where you are handling the, the goods when you are delivering at, at the actual location. So you're essentially in this situation at a stationary position and you're actually handling the goods. Uh, obviously, this is uh, very problematic. Maybe few people are exposed to that when it, this happens, but it can be very problematic for those exposed. And then the other issue is, of course, the question of traffic in very quiet environments. So this is ex essentially the outline of my presentation. We will focus on the, the goods handling first, and then we will, we will move, more, move on to the traffic noise. And we will see that there are common ways of addressing 
the uh, the issue in a relative sense of uh, of noise noise generation and exposure in those two situations. So I'll take this sample example, and we will take that as a little uh, case study for the entire presentation, where we where you see here in Stockholm um, in the initial project that we or one of the initial projects in the eccentric project that we have been dealing with, there was a few set delivery locations around Stockholm that were uh, that were taken as a whole pilot study. So this fixed location would be delivered goods by night or evening or early morning. And the, uh, the uh, idea was first to have a look at those locations. What is going to impact the fact that those locations are going to be very sensitive when it comes to noise assessment or not? And then there are a few obvious influential par uh, parameters that should be taken into account. Essentially, you have the distance from the unloading dock to the entrance because that's the, the path for handling goods and that's where you have a high potential for generating a lot of noise. And then of course, it's the quality of the surfaces you are actually uh, you're moving the goods on because that is going to generate your high source of noise for the equipment that is going to be rolling on those surfaces. And of course, there is the question of how is the track related to the sidewalk? Uh, and how is the how is the actual infrastructure planned so that you can reach the sidewalk from the truck when you're delivering goods? So you have six locations. We have excluded one of them, the one in Slussen here, because this one was a covered covered location delivery location, so it doesn't really respond to the same kind of criteria. So it's uh, slightly ex excluded from from this first uh, discussion there. And then you have a few qualitative. Uh, assessment of those three parameters for these uh, uh, different locations. Don't really need to go into detail right now. We will come back to this. What did we have at hand in order to be able to assess the noise? Well, we essentially we we uh, we developed some noise monitors that could be uh, could be connected directly mounted on on the truck, so close to the source. The source being either the engine noise if that track would be running, or it could be just the source when it comes to starting the handling of goods from the track to the actual delivery location. So you have a very, if you position the monitors on the track, you have a very consistent approach to, to, uh, to the distance to the actual uh, source of noise, which is a bit more complicated if you put the, the uh, receive the microphones on the other hand at the actual delivery location, because then you have uh, the distance, for instance, to the truck and the delivery path is, is going to be handled in, in a different way. So what we did, it was just did both. We actually had in some locations, we had a microphone, stationary microphones, which were monitoring 24 seven, what was happening in terms of uh, noise variations. And then we had microphones mounted on the truck which could assess both the driving noise and uh, to a degree also the delivery noise. The, the idea with having also two microphones is that you have a different distance to the actual source with these two microphones. So you could play between those two microphones in order to be able to pick up maybe more what was happening in terms of baseline noise in the area where you are or more picking up what is really happening at the source of the noise you are trying to trying to get. So this is something I will not really come into detail, but essentially with 30 seconds logs at this uh, fixed location in, at Volkengrath, and this is what it looks like when you are actually uh, picking up the, the noise levels in a fairly uh, not so refined time, uh, uh, time resolution here. But if you go, so this is this would be a, a fairly noisy place. You see, uh, between here it's one o'clock to uh, one fifteen. You have still a fairly noisy area, and it's hard to pick up exactly when the delivery would be happening. And you have you have two different measures here. You could, in simplified way, say that the green one is actually picking up what a baseline level, which is more associated with the background noise. And then maybe what is happening in blue would be more picking up what is happening in terms of handling goods. Now, if you move to another location, Lilio Holman, that happened at six o'clock in the morning, around six o'clock in the morning. 
And you can see that when you pick up the baseline noise level compared to what is happening in terms of energy uh, quantity, that would be very much linked to the delivery. And then you, you can sense already there that you would have a very big impact, potential impact of what is happening. But if we just take it without relating those two, this background versus extra contribution of noise from the sources, if we just derive absolute indicators from this in terms of classifying the different delivery locations in their potential to generate noise or the problematic aspect of these delivery locations, then you would have a first ranking of those different locations. By highest level, this Falkring Agatan, very active area, has the highest level amount of noise in the area, not necessarily only uh, due to the delivery uh, itself. And then you have a very quiet location, but this very quiet location is also very sensitive to potential addition of noise. So this is a first picture, and this is maybe more the way that noise has been addressed a lot in, in the literature. And generally speaking, you have absolute levels, you have limits which shouldn't be exceeded, and you just go and measure and have these, these uh, these absolute levels not to uh, constraints not to exceed. And if you have a look in terms of contributions, just this is now taken just for the time of the delivery. If you look at what could be the sources there, you could relate, you could relate the noisiest places to the quietest places, in part due to the, the way that the uh, the delivery location is made. If you take those very noisy places, what you what you notice is that actually the transition from, from, the, from the, uh, the parking spot and the uh, pavement was actually really bad from a, a good handling point of view. And, and this is, if you, you can imagine if you go back and forth between the track and the delivery location, this is going to trigger uh, a lot of, of rattling noise. On top of that, you have a delivery pathway that was longer for those locations than, for instance, this other, a fairly noisy location where you still have a problem with transitions, but you have a shorter delivery pathway. So then it means that energy-wise, if you have this energy-based indicator, you are producing a bit uh, um, less noise over the, uh, over the time of delivery. And then you have those quieter uh, delivery locations, dock, docking and loading uh, areas where you have better transitions this one has actually something that was planned at, in Yodgatan plan to actually transition from the road to the, to the sidewalk. And in Lili Holman, you even have no transition. You are just uh, on a flat ground and then you have some maybe irregularities on the ground, but no big transition. So it, it appears very clearly from, from this that there were the, the, those influential parameters that we were looking at, the, the, they indeed turned out to be uh, very influential when you are looking at, at uh, absolute levels. Now, the problem when we are talking about comparing those delivery locations is if you look at this stationary position there, that was Falkring Agatan, you're measuring over 24 hours, 24 7, so you're continuously monitoring the noise levels. Uh, you obviously have very sharp differences between daytime. 70 dB at the facade in this case, weekdays and averaged over the weekends in the, in the orange here, to only 60 dB at the quietest time of the night. So that would be a 10 dB difference. And you, you uh, remember that this would be perceived as, if you just take this 10 dB difference, as a doubling of the actual noise that you are exposed to. And that is very important to take into account because that in, the, in this, we don't really take the actual delivery is happening in this segment. So that's regardless of the delivery. So obviously the, the time you're going to schedule the delivery is going to be very important. If you schedule the delivery in a very noisy part of the day, you are less likely to be disturbed or annoyed by the delivery itself. When if you schedule the delivery in this very quiet segment of the day, then you obviously have potential problems there, or much more problems, especially when this corresponds to sleeping time. So the, the idea is illustrated like this. Among those six deliveries that were scheduled, you can see that some were scheduled in the evening between 9 and 10, 30. And then you had a few deliveries since we have Egan and Lee Holman, which were scheduled in this very quiet moment of the day. You have here the representation around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 
when it's, it becomes very sensitive. So you really can have, an, compared to the baseline, you, ca you can get close to, in this case here, yeah, it's about seven dB difference in the baseline levels between the locations. And that has to be taken into account. If you take Svia Vegan, which was a fairly noisy, noisy location to start with when you just purely measure the noise in terms of handling the goods, well, it turns out that this delivery is also located at six o'clock, one of the quietest moments of the night. So you need to take that into account and, and derive instead maybe relative indicators, where instead of taking the, the energy-based or event-based noise measures, event being that you take the maximum levels that are being reached over the duration of the delivery, for instance, you have to relate those levels to the existing levels in the background at the time where you're doing the delivery. And you, you see that if you do that, the ranking of the different locations in terms of how bad they are performing, the higher the, bad, the, the worse, well, is completely changed by taking this into the background. And actually, obviously, the, the locations, those two locations which happened, where the deliveries happened at the quietest time of the day, are becoming maybe the worst configurations for deliveries. Okay, so that's just to, to introduce a little bit the, the idea about taking a relative assessment of the, of the noise level instead of going, uh, or go, going through absolute measurements that would give you um, uh, a biased or a not complete picture on the, of the impact of the actual deliveries or the noise generation in a certain area. Uh, obviously, um, I will not uh, detail that, but you could also use what happens at the facade noise uh, monitoring. So those stationary microphones that we had on the facades, you could use those ones. If you have a nicely scheduled delivery that happens more or less every day around the same time, you can average those levels over long periods of time. So, and, and this is what is illustrated here. So you have the average levels for non-delivery days. So there's no delivery happening in orange. And then blue is the days where you have deliveries happening. And then if you average that over long periods of time, you have an energy-based assessment. Essentially what is happening between those two curves gives you an indication of the impact of the delivery itself at the facade level. But that's it for the uh, relative assessment of, of noise when it comes to handling goods. And we will see that we will come back to that exactly the same principle when it comes to assessing noise from traffic, which is the second part I'm going to focus, focus on here. So what happens, the idea of what we want to do is essentially you have now a route, you have a vehicle that is going from point A to B in an urban environment, and you want to assess the actual impact of that, that vehicle given that drought, given the time of driving, given the type of, of road that has been, and technology maybe type of track that has been running in this area. So this is what we will go through. We'll take this dynamic uh, approach to actually evaluate the impact of noise from, from certain vehicles in the, in the transport system. And then we will, we will illustrate the way that maybe noise in an urban environment should be represented compared to the way it is today represented with this, what we call here, this noise impact sensitivity mapping, where you highlight the, the sensitive areas when it comes to noise of the city, rather than just showing those absolute levels as we have introduced before for the handling, handling uh, goods handling noise. And in the end, I will just illustrate something about the interest of including this uh, dynamic assessment of noise in, in, uh, in routing questions, which is, I think, something that relates very well to ITR. So this is, this is the way today uh, traffic noise is assessed at the European level. You have from, uh, since 2002, you have a European directive that imposes to cities of uh, exceeding 100,000 inhabitants to generate those maps, which are called noise maps, which highlight these noisy segments. So you have here the example of the island of Southern Mal in Stockholm. So you see the noisy or noisy roads in the area compared to less noisy roads segments, which are where the traffic is lesser compared to those 
major axis. And the problem with that, this is that it, it, okay, it gives you an idea of where the noise is in the city, but it doesn't really give you an idea of anything in terms of impact because you have to relate. This is so centric. It relates to the, to the vehicles, to the traffic flow, but it doesn't really reflect to the actual population. So how do you bring this to, to impact assessment where you take the angle of the receivers? The other thing with those maps is that they are, they are static. They, they essentially correspond to a long time averages for a full year. Essentially, you take into consideration day, evening, and night with different weightings. And then you make an average, you produce an average map corresponding to this, um, to this average over long periods of time. So it doesn't give you any idea in terms of time segments in the way that we would be maybe interested when it comes to off peak. Traffic, uh, traffic, for instance. And then, as I mentioned, this is source centric by definition, and this is, has not much to do with impact. So how can we assess the impact on people? And another question is also, how can we assess the impact of singled out vehicles in a transport system? Let's say that we are working now in a, in a, in a transport system in, in transformation where, uh, where the type of vehicles composing the, the transport system can be very different and we are moving towards an electrified vehicle. How can we assess the comparative impact of a diesel-driven vehicle compared to an electrified vehicle? Well, what we are, what we are doing is, is following this uh, chain is actually basing modeling on, on the basis of micro-level uh, distribution where we, we assume that at some point, in time, it will not be an issue to get information in terms of micro-level traffic and not be an issue in terms of processing that. Whether we are already there, that's a different question, but it doesn't seem like if you think about autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles to get this information, it's already there, it's just a matter of accessing it. So we, we took the premise to start, in, to start from micro-level traffic distributions. And the advantage with that is that we can then we can then apply source models specified for the different types of vehicles. So you have different categories of vehicles and we can specify that there are existing models for, for the source noise models, which can be allocated to each individual vehicle in the system. And then you can, we can simulate the propagation from those vehicles in a diversity of environments. So then you have a propagation model from the source to the actual receivers taking into account a uh, few factors such as the buildings and the properties of reflection absorption of the environment and things like this. And that allows you to, of course, bring the source to the receiver and then to be able to post-process that and, and have an, uh, a receiver-centric assessment of the uh, noise and the exposure then in the end. So let's take an example. We go back to these delivery locations, the six locations, and we take one of the locations, which was in Slussen here in, uh, in uh, Sadoman, and the truck was driving along this road in order to reach Medvoya Platsen at, uh, at the center of the island. So what, what would be the impact of having this truck running this road in different times of the day with different types of trucks? Well, this is something we can do. We can do going back to the same methodology as before. We can take an assumption on the baseline levels in these areas at different times of the day. So you could be looking at 5 a.m. in the morning, 8 a.m. when you start to be at peak traffic. And you have different baseline levels in terms of noise levels in these areas. So you can have here, if you bring these map, baseline maps to a dynamic assessment or um, interpolate them during the day to, to actually have a baseline level, you have a starting point. And then on top of that, you are going to add this, this truck that is going to be driving. And for that, you need to model the truck and you need to have a source model for the truck. So there are existing models. You can see here a, a model that is actually a, a, a linear model on a decibel scale. Uh, and that is actually uh, issued from measurements, this kind of, of model. So essentially it's a velocity dependent 
uh, model, you have more complex models, which could be also acceleration dependent. But in, in the case that we're talking about, uh, we have actually identified those parameters for measurements on the track in terms of the source noise. And you, you can see here that you have, this was a hybrid track, so you have two technologies. When the track is driving on, on diesel, you have a very good correlation with this uh, regression line there for the, uh, the actual source noise levels for the track uh, when you are considering the uh, this dependence on velocity. And then you have another, another model that is corresponding to the electrified version when the truck is switching to the hybrid mode. So this is what we have done, identified the, uh, the equivalent source model for this truck. And what we do next is that we, you can actually pick up the GPS, the coordinates uh, from the truck, since the, we had a GPS also on the truck in order to be able to, to pick up the positions and the associated velocity. And then you can re recreate the route of the truck from point A to B. Uh, you interpolate in order to add a few points in between. And this is essentially what then we can be simulating from the source model, simulating in terms of propagation. So this is the example of simulation, taking purely the simulation. What you see here, you see here in the middle, this will be the origin of the track, the track uh, that is going to be driving along this road. And all those points that you get to see is absolute noise levels. So, so now we don't take any baseline levels. That's what the track is producing as diff at different receivers uh, around, around its driving position. So you can see how it looks like from a simulation point of view. So the track is starting from Slusen, and then you can see the receiver points that correspond to facade points on different buildings. The track is now driving from Slusen, turning down, going back on Polkengagatan, and then you see buildings affected uh, differently, depending if you pass a park or if you're close to uh, narrow buildings, corridors, like in this area, or if you have a street that is going. So this is a starting point in terms of, of simulation. And of course, you have to calibrate that maybe with measurements on certain facade levels to be sure that the actual uh, propagation, le uh, propagation levels that are being calculated are actually correct. Now, if we want to talk about relative assessment, well, you have to take into account this baseline level and essentially generate a differential between these two uh, cases. And this is what is illustrated then in this next simulation. Now you take anything that is exceeding this baseline level at a certain time and you, you calculate the uh, differential between these two. So the exceedance compared to the baseline level generated by the track when it moves on this, on this road. And what do we do from that? Well, then you can aggregate all those exceedance levels and you can compare different scenarios. You can take this internal combustion engine track and you take it into daytime when it's peak hours, so you have a high baseline level. And then you decide to move, to shift this track from peak to off peak deliveries. And obviously, yeah, then you can assess, you can actually assess the impact in terms of increase, in terms of noise production, but also in noise exposure since, since now you have the level at the points of, of uh, the receivers. And then you can also assess the impact of changing technology. If you still, you keep the same time of peak and you shift to a hybrid version of the track, which allows you then to, uh, assess, to assess the impact in terms of weighting this differential with respect to the population distribution and to have different types of analysis of the impact. Now, what I presented before, the baseline levels, they were based on those noise maps and an interpolation of those noise maps based on measurements. But ultimately, what you really would like to have is to generate this baseline level from the actual traffic from a dynamic point of view. And this, this is what is illustrated here. If instead you take a portion of this transport system and you have the complete description of the transport in this area, Optimized now for video clips, yes. So what you get to see now, you, you get, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, just uh, we assume that all the vehicles are the same. 
And what you get to see is now this dynamic baseline level that is being generated in this case. So for each time segment, you have the baseline level at the level of the, at the points, at the receiver points for this specific part of the transport system. And the idea is to use that as a baseline level instead of the, uh, the uh, interpolated maps that are being generated on long time averages. So what would be a relative assessment then? That, well, with this, then it means you can really uh, go into detail assessment of the contribution from a single vehicle. So if we follow this vehicle here, in this dynamic assessment of the baseline, you can see the contribution compared to the contributions that are ma being made by the rest of the transport system. So when the truck was traveling among other vehicles, the actual impact was fairly low because it was masked more or less by the other source of sources of noise, but when it's traveling alone in a street that is fairly quiet, then you, you, can, you can understand that the impact is going to be much higher. So this is a kind of thing that we can post process. Now, this is just a, a brief uh, summary, but essentially in this dynamic impact assessment, the key is to get access to the transport, transport data at a micro level. So uh, this is something that actually uh, in order to get input data, we have been uh, collaborating with the University of Tartu, which was actually in a project that was uh, driven by ITRA with the JUST project. And the idea of what they are doing is that they are closing a loop. And uh, if you get all the entry exit points such an, uh, on an island, a uh, Sudaman, you have input in, uh, incoming, outcoming traffic. In the first approximation, you, you could weigh the different segments according to to the, the density of traffic on those segments and, and uh, then uh, redistribute this micro-level traffic in those different segments so that you can have access to this dynamic impact. Of course, it's only a representation, synthetic representation at that stage. But until you actually get the full input data in terms of micro-level, this is maybe a good first step to take in order to consider different scenarios. I would like to, to uh, conclude these last few minutes with the, how, how do you actually use that in a fairly simplified way, this dynamic assessment? And the idea is to move from these strategic noise maps that I've mentioned, the way that noise is evaluated today. So this is a portion of the city of Munich. And, and this is what I've presented before. Essentially, you see the major roads, which are the most noisy, but you have no idea. It doesn't give you any indication about the actual uh, exposure. And the idea of what we, we, we've done is that you take this baseline and then you put a vehicle that travels on all the segments of the, of the street. So you can simulate over the entire of the, of the city. So over the entire area, different types of vehicles and you can generate for different classes of vehicles these sensitivity maps. And those would be time dependent because they are dependent on the baseline levels. Uh, and they would be of, obviously also potentially population dependent, dynamically dependent, because you could take into account motion of population under different times, and they are population weighted. So what you get to see here as an indicator is a contribution of exceedance in terms of noise levels combined with population being exposed to these exceedance levels. And you can see that obviously it gives you a very different picture. This is exactly the same area, but you can see in red here, hot zones where the noise is going to be a very sensitive issue. When you have other areas in blue here, which would, wouldn't be a problem, although, although they were pictured out potentially problematic in terms of noise here. And this is what we want to work with when it comes to, to discussing the transport system. So as I mentioned, there would be dynamic. If you take an internal combustion track, you look at the sensi sensitivity of adding that track in this transport system, Early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the, in the afternoon, you have a very different uh, picture in terms of impact and sensitivity mapping. And the same goes if you, you would want to compare uh, different technologies, same time, but you switch from an uh, internal combustion engine to a hybrid truck. So how can you use that? Well, I conclude with this little example, just a, a, a sample, very simplified, optimization problem for, for routing. So let's go back to the six delivery locations. 
Uh, and we assume a, a pseudo depot that is uh, close to the uh, the uh, the cities or the, yeah central city of Stockholm. Instead of being a bit further away from the from the city, it doesn't really bring anything. And we we simplify the problem quite a bit. We assume the six locations, but we assume that the truck and it's obviously it's a very wrong assumption, but it's just for the sake of argument that this truck can cover all those locations delivery in one route. You just, it's just a matter of order, sales minds problems. You just have to, uh, to choose which, which delivery location should come first and then order them and choose the routes in between so that you can have, you can minimize certain, uh, certain uh, objectives. And what we are interested in is looking at the distance that is being covered by the truck. It could be the time covered, the time uh, used in order to proceed to all those deliveries or the noise exposure. And for the noise exposure, of course, we generate those noise exposure potential, those sensitivity maps for the area of Stockholm, which will be time dependent and dependent on population. And the last point is what if you, instead of looking at those objectives individually, you combine those. And I think that relates to the geofencing that uh, Gezo was talking about earlier. What if you combine distance, time, and noise in the same objective point? So what you see here is different routes, and I'm not going to detail, it's not really the point here, but the, the idea is to present the different routes depending on whether you optimize with respect to distance, time, or noise exposure alone. And the idea here is that, as you can see, both in the order and the routes that are being taken, you end up having very different results. And of course, then you combine those which is a much more uh, holistic approach to, to the problem. What if you want to take into account now distance, time, and noise? And I will just summarize it on this one slide to conclude the, the talk. This is what you get to see here is we take the distance optimized routing. And let's say that we want to shift this one to other measures for the optimization. What do we gain or lose in terms of, of distance, in terms of noise, in terms of time? So what if we take the optimal solution when it comes to distance and we move on to the noise exposure optimized routing? Well, obviously we will have like almost like here, it's a 55% increase in distance. We'll have a sharp increase, 35% increase in time for the routing. And as expected, you're moving to noise exposure, optimized solution. You, are you, you have the potential to decrease by about 35% in this case, the exposure, the actual exposure in terms of population and level combined uh, uh, to noise. All right, that's expected. Nothing really surprising from this. You're losing here and you're winning here. What is interesting is when you combine the distance, the time, and the noise, you put these together. What is quite interesting to, to find here is that you actually have less than 10% increase in driving distance to this combined optimized case, almost no increase in delivery time, less about 1% in this case, but you still observe about, it's even more than 20% decrease in noise exposure impact. So obviously the, the message here is that noise should be included in an overall, uh, overall discussion in terms of the transport system and optimized routing and, and consideration like this one. And I will conclude just on this one. So essentially, uh, those two aspects, handling noise and traffic noise, which we have been handling in terms of a relative assessment, you need to take into account what is happening already in the location where you are in terms of ambient noise or background noise. And then you can add, you actually make the assessment in terms of extra contribution from the sources, bringing that to the receiver end in terms of the exposure assessment. When it comes to the road traffic assessment, what we need is input data. And I think that's where you working at RTRL can be very good contact points to be able to get this input data. And then what we can provide is this, this last little snapshot about sensitivity mapping. When you bring the actual population 
time of day type of vehicles into the picture in order to be able to provide an overall uh, noise exposure assessment for, from a traffic system. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And if you have questions about some aspects that you've seen today, your ideas about links, you're most welcome to share those now. Thank you, Romain, very interesting. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can use the raise hand feature or post it in the chat. And I see we have one from Jonas. Yes, hello, Roman. Uh, very nice presentation, very interesting. Uh, I have uh, one or two questions. Uh, the first thing uh, I was thinking when you presented this, um, uh, I mean, the relation between vehicle velocity and uh, the, the noise levels. Uh, is there also, I mean, there, there you have, um, uh, yeah, whatever measure it is there, LA, I, I, uh, not really sure what the measure is there, but, but uh, the, the question is related to frequency. So if you, if you uh, change the, the speed of the vehicle, you would also change uh, some frequency content of the, of the noise. And you also mentioned that, that frequency, you had this wa frequency weighting. So is, yes. uh, uh, is there a potential to control the, the frequency content uh, by changing the, the operating mode of the vehicle? I mean, the, the engine speed or, or, or things like this, or, or is it a sort of a too, too narrow band anyway uh, to make a difference? No, this is an extremely uh, uh, good question. Uh, I actually... I just leave the, left it uh, here, this formula, and doesn't want to get into any details about that. But the actual level you get in the end, uh, you see those indexes there. So those, those, this is some power level. So this relates to the source. And this is actually done by frequency band. So you actually taking into, when you, you do aggregate that to an overall level, you actually do take into account the frequency components uh, from the from the uh, the source that you are willing to represent, actually. So this is definitely something that is of uh, of very high importance when you are changing the type of vehicle from from diesel to uh, to uh, uh, to electrified vehicle, for instance. So there is a possibility, and it is done. The aggregated level that you take in the end is actually taking into account the different bands of frequencies. So this is just one band that is illustrated here. Mm. Yes, I said. But you need to decompose it into several bands. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, great. And then the, the, the second question is, uh, in the end, when, when you, uh, you focus on these uh, differential levels or sort of increase in compared to the base level, the base uh, baseline, but then you, if you only do that, you risk increasing the, the peak values instead. If you, I mean, then then you you said, well, I mean, one effect is to to route vehicles where there are already a lot of uh, of traffic. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, how how do you handle that? Yes. So actually, about those indicators, this is a there is a full uh, PhD that is is focused exclusively on that, about when you take an overall, uh, let's say a systemic view of noise that is being generated, how do you allocate that to different uh, components of, of the system and put a cost to that? Because of course, linked to your question is when you are shifting, uh, shifting the, uh, the uh, the traffic between peaks or off peaks, you're, you're also going to affect differently the overall noise and that should be taken into account. So the, the, the question of cost allocation is actually, it's a very big one. And, and there are a few, uh, so the, a few models that are, uh, that are being tested actually by our PhD student uh, on, on how to distribute that. And it's a very difficult because the, the, the underlying assumption of, of everything is, in noise is based on long-term averages. So as soon as you want to bring it back to, to very short-term like this, you're breaking some assumptions. So there's no perfect way of really doing that allocation in the end, uh, but he's looking at different ways. And actually, I think it's quite, uh, 
I, in this small community, it's quite a hot topic and he's doing quite some interesting things there. And the idea there is to bring that in terms of, uh, of uh, cost directly linked to the exposure. So to bring that in, in terms of monetary uh, uh, measures so that you can bring that into, into uh, optimization with regard to other kind of, of uh, constraints or objectives. But it's it's not uh, yeah it, it's not a tri trivial problem. But uh, in any case, the sensitivity sensitivity itself, the this increase compared to the baseline, is still a fairly good simplified representation in the first approach, uh, because that's what we yeah what we are after. I'm not sure you were mentioning that. Um, was your question that also how to address the fact that yeah the when you're shifting to acquired time the overall baseline level is going to increase as well yeah maybe maybe that's what uh, what the consequence would be yes but it but then then if you take the complete dynamic approach where you have all the vehicles in the system this case here then this is fully taken into account uh, uh, because the baseline is included is generated by the other vehicles. So if you are shif shif shifting this, no, sorry, it's not this one, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, when the baseline is generated from this, all the vehicles in the, in the traffic system, then the, then you are sure not to, uh, when you are doing this assessment for a single vehicle, and if you are moving this vehicle at different time, uh, time steps in, in the system, then the, uh, the baseline is already relying on the existing vehicles. Uh, okay, and then and, and in the other one, the baseline is uh, well, it's it's uh, all other traffic that is not in your model or or uh, some yes. other background uh, noise. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it's it's interpolated from those noise maps, which should be taken with a lot of cautious. So that's that's mm. the reason why we decided to go for the recreating the baseline from the micro level traffic. So what? Uh, uh, maybe there are more questions. I should not take all the time. But but the, what what about sort of the time distribution of? Uh, I mean, it re relates to frequency to some extent. But I mean, if you have uh, peaks, intermittent, uh, uh, high high volumes uh, compared to uh, uh, focusing on the, the noise on a, on a short time period, those type of uh, of things. Yes. Well, one thing I could say connected to that is that. Obviously, you have to consider differently peak traffic or like compared to free flow traffic. Uh, where uh, in, in peak traffic, maybe this long term, long term averages and essentially the absolute exposure is a fairly good indicator. When you move to off peak, those single events and the number of these events. So you, you need to derive different indicators. So that's again one, one thing that this PhD student is looking at. When you're looking at the nighttime, it's a number of events to a certain level. How do you put them together? And, and more importantly, how do you compare then the indicators that you have to derive when it's high density traffic to very sparse traffic? Yeah, this is, um, this is also working progress when you have to include the number of events, the seriousness of the events compared to just what is happening at fairly high absolute levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, but thank you, thank you very much. And just a reminder, we soon need to get started on our uh, writing. Yes, this comes today for me. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to write to, uh, yes, yeah. to you and others about uh, things I need as input, but I think uh, this week and next week is the goal. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Thank you for your questions, Jonas, and thanks for yes. a very interesting presentation, Romain. Uh, we have unfortunately run out of time, so uh, we're going to stop the recording. I uh, want to remind you to keep an eye out on our channels for the upcoming breakfast webinars in the, in the fall. And yeah, thank you very much for this semester. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you all of you for attending today.